Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Weather Center Nazario. I know it's been a long weekend. I've been away for a little bit, but we did have a live stream last night to cover some of the information that I'm going to be talking to you guys about today. We're going to rapidly go through this video because, unfortunately, it seems like the change in the temperature outside has my sinuses acting up, so we're going to blast through this. Please check in with me later tonight at 8 p.m. We are still going to do our tropics talk if you'd like a little more information on everything I'm going to cover. As the name of this video implies, the tropics are alive and they're kicking. We have a lot to talk about a lot of changing dynamics not only over the United States that are likely going to be responsible for what could maybe form out in the tropical AOR across the span of the Gulf of Mexico to the eastern Atlantic but also because of the dynamics over the U.S. we have all that tropical energy in the East Pack that's working its way into the Gulf of Mexico as we speak. All right everybody we're taking a look at our wide view satellite shot because I want to highlight exactly where it is we're going to be paying close attention to not only over the next couple of days but the next couple of weeks for that matter. Starting from left to right, out in the eastern Pacific, it's a little hard for you to see, but we have Tropical Storm Max and Tropical Storm Lydia, who is very close to approaching hurricane strength and is likely to do so before making landfall into parts of central to northern Mexico. Some of the HAFS A and B model data indicates we could see a Category 2 or stronger before we have a landfall from Lydia within the next 24 to 36 hours. I'll openly admit I'm going to keep the proudness levels to a minimum for this video, but I do humbly admit I'm excited to tell you guys that National Hurricane Center is highlighting something in the Bay of Campeche. And if you've been a follower of Weather Center Nazario for the last couple of weeks now, I've been emphasizing why it is we need to pay close attention to that area, and National Hurricane Center has officially confirmed our suspicions. This system is likely to track off to the east and the northeast over time, making landfall somewhere between Mississippi and the panhandle of Florida. Maybe not as an organized tropical system or a named storm at that matter, but something along the realm of a hybrid type of subtropical low or even an El Nino type of system with tropical storm conditions likely near its vortex. Next up, moving right along, we do have a tropical wave helping to increase thunderstorm activity in the Caribbean for parts of Jamaica, Cuba, and the Cayman Islands as it continues to work its way off to the west. This is going to be an area I want to pay close attention to because just like the Bay of Campeche, now that we have that unfolding as we speak, I'm starting to detect some long-range model data that suggests we could get another round of something forming in the western Caribbean in the Gulf of Mexico. We'll get to that here momentarily. Finally, we're going to turn our attention out to the main development region. We have our invest area that has a 90% chance of development over the next seven days. I believe somewhere between 70 to 80% chance of development in the next 48 hours. We're really starting to see some really good circulating out of that system, some good consolidation in the thunderstorm activity. Very low shear environment. All the shear, if you look at the satellite, is just to the north. You can see that big clearing in the cloud cover and then some good dry air associated with the trough to the north. So it's in a good environment for it to finally develop. Take that name title of Tropical Storm Sean here over the next couple of days. And then believe it or not, according to the European model from 0Z to 12Z today, this next area of energy coming off the African coast is something we may want to monitor for the Lesser Antilles. All right, guys, we went from left to right. We've covered our bases in terms of what we're looking at in the tropics. I'm going to explain to you first and foremost what the live stream was about yesterday. And the reason I'm a little bit more concerned about the Caribbean to include the Cayman Islands, Cuba, and eventually the peninsula of Florida, maybe even the Bahamas. Hear me out. I'm not hyping up. Not talking hurricane formation specifically. I want to talk dynamics. I want to talk big picture dynamics, which is why I want to put a little more emphasis in my investigation of what the environmental conditions look like in the Caribbean that could maybe be a little bit more favorable for some kind of formation sometime between October 18th to the 22nd. Let's get into that. Alrighty, guys. So what we're looking at here is our 500 millibar geopotential height anomaly chart. The reason I have this up is not only is it a great tool for highlighting where all of your large scale weather features are, but it's a great tool if you want to analyze change in the upper level environment. And that's exactly what we're going to look like here, which is why my suspicions and my eyebrows are raised. See them going up right now? My eyebrows are raised and my eyes are set on the Caribbean. Let's take this through the time. So on the left hand side here, we have some of our most recent GFS data. And I know that the GFS is a little wonky sometimes, but the main reason we're using GFS is because it gives us the longest look out into the future, whereas a lot of our other mid to long range models will stop just about the time frame we could start to see some development. So anyways, on the left-hand side, we have our 12Z for today, and on the right-hand side, we actually have the 12Z for the 7th, because across the board, the Euro, the GFS, the Canadian, the Icon, the Korean, everybody, there's been a big change in the way our upper air pattern is going to be structured over North America that could help to make it a little bit more susceptible of an environment for something tropical to form in our Caribbean. So if you go through time and you watch what happens with our upper air features, and I want you to watch that right-hand chart first. So you can see we have have a good anti-cyclone
cyclone over the Gulf, over the Caribbean early on in the run, and then watch how that big trough axis is going to develop our system out over the Great Plains, really deepens down and digs its way all the way through the southeast into the Gulf of Mexico, trying to touch the northern periphery of the Caribbean Sea. Now, real quick, fixate on that for a second, and then go ahead and look to the left-hand side. Do you see a noticeable difference? Because this has been trending on a lot of our models. What that means is our long wave trough and our associated ridge are going to be a lot less amplified. On that right hand side, you can see a very sharp amplitude ridge over western CONUS and a deeply amplified cold air trough over the eastern United States. Not only does that mean that we're going to have a lot more shear in the environment down there across the Gulf and the Caribbean, that also means we're going to have a lot more cold air out there. And if you would have asked me this question last week, I would have said absolutely not. There's no chance of development down there. There's going to be way too much cold air, way too much shear, way too much dry air moving into that region. It was essentially going to flush any kind of remnant tropical energy down there out altogether. This changes things because if this trough does not decide to dig its way all the way down into the southeast, it changes two dynamics or two environmental patterns, if you will. A more amplified pattern, as you see on the right hand side, is also going to stop things up. It's going to act like a blockade for the jet stream, for the overall synoptic scale pattern across North America and the Caribbean Central American landmass as well. If we have a weaker trough, not only is that shear and that dry air, as well as the cold air that was expected to marinate out over the Gulf of Mexico and going to stay further to the north, but it's also going to allow these features to move faster, which means any shear that's down there preventing any development is going to get out of the picture quicker. So as you go through time, we're going to go to the very tail end of both loops. If you notice, that trough on the right-hand side definitely sticks around a lot longer. You can still see the base of it somewhere over Cuba, the Yucatan Peninsula, which means if I were to draw you guys where my shear would be, the shear is going to be all in this general area associated with the shared energy between our subtropical jet that's alive and kicking as well because of El Nino and the polar front jet digging in far to the south. If you go to the left-hand side of the screen, our shear is actually going to be up over the Gulf Coast states and the Florida Peninsula, or I should say the northern periphery of the Florida Peninsula, the Gulf Coast of Gulf of Mexico as well. So big difference, that means our frontal system is not going to move all the way down to the south. It's going to leave a lot of remnant energy, a lot of good moisture in a very favorable environment because of the heat, because of the anticyclonic curvature aloft provided by our subtropical jet. So this kind of changes things. If this pattern keeps up and we do see another frontal system kick its way down to the south into the Western Caribbean, like we're seeing right now in the Bay of Campeche, there's definitely some indications that, you know, it's not impossible for us to see another tropical cyclone spin up. To really quickly reiterate what I was mentioning going over those anomaly charts, if you look at both sides, once again, 12Z on the left-hand side for today, 12Z for the 7th on the right-hand side, and as you go through time, you can see just how far to the south that jet really digs in. You can see all that good wind flow digging its way into the northern base of the Caribbean Sea and across the Gulf of Mexico, and this is exactly why last week, if you guys had asked me, I'd have said, no way. No way, Jose. There's nothing going to form down there. We're not going to see Tammy. We're not going to see anything. I believe the tropics are going to shut down just looking at that meridional long wave pattern. Notice how, if you remember just a couple moments ago, I said that longer features or stronger features will slow the pattern down. Look at how on the left-hand side, that same trough is already into the Western Atlantic, whereas on the right-hand side, we're still digging in across Florida, the Gulf of Mexico, and that shear, that dry air is going to remain in place for much longer. And with everything that goes through the pattern, if you have a trough, what comes behind it? There's a ridge. And if you look now, we have a much more conducive environment over the Gulf of Mexico. Mexico and over the Caribbean with an anti-cyclone building in right overhead, eliminating a lot of that wind shear that was present earlier in the runs last week and into the early parts of the weekend. As a result, the GFS is doing its GFS-isms as always, so we're actually going to go back in time to 12Z yesterday, believe it or not, to show you what the models are starting to think in terms of that change and where our unfavorable conditions are going to be. You go through towards the back end of the run and take a look at what decides to undergo cyclogenesis and form up and push right towards the Florida Peninsula. And now hold that thought. I know a lot of you are getting ready to jump in my comments and say, you're hyping. It's one run. Let's take a look. Here's our Canadian model for today. The Canadian model has been indicating something spinning up down there. It just didn't make it that far out in time. You go to the very tail end of the run and take a look at that. We have something deepening and forming up, headed up towards the Florida Peninsula, impacting the Cayman Islands and Cuba between the dates of the 17th to the 19th of October. This iteration, albeit weaker, I actually feel, and I feel comfortable saying, I have more 
more faith in this than the GFS. Not only because the GFS tends to be very bullish in terms of wanting to form a major hurricane at a moment's notice, but at the same time, since we are still going to have a trough in place, you can see that 1024 high over the Carolinas in place, which is very indicative that we're going to have a lot of cool modified air entrenched across the southeast. So if anything does try to form and move to the north and try to escape the Caribbean AOR, it might be on the weaker side because it's going to have to try to punch through a frontal boundary, elevated wind shear, and that cool air trying to modify the pattern for parts of the Gulf of Mexico and interior parts of the land of central Florida and further to the north. You can see the same thing on our Korean model. I've been looking at the Korean model a lot more these days because it's been verifying very well against some of our other models like the GFS, the Euro, the Icon, and so on. And at the very tail end of the run, this has also been trending. You can see at the exact same time, take a look at that timestamp, 0Z on the 19th of October. We're starting to get that tropical cyclone spinning up and then moving right up towards western Cuba and eventually towards the Florida Peninsula. Once again, a weaker depiction, and I have full faith and confidence that that's something a little more realistic that we could possibly see in the Caribbean versus a Cat 4 hurricane spinning up. Could we get a major hurricane out of the Caribbean? Absolutely. It's been done many, many times before. It's been done many, many times throughout history. It is not off the table. My professional opinion, though, if anything does decide to take shape with everything in the environment involved right now, I would kind of suggest and lean more towards the weaker side just for now until we get a little closer in time and can get a better representation of what the atmosphere is doing. Also, before we switch gears one more time, look at that little bad boy, some elevated winds and a little bit of a tropical wave. We're going to get to that here in a second. All right, let's talk real time. So if you look out there in the MDR, we still have our system moving in. That's going to be Tropical Storm Sean here very soon. 80% chance of development over the next seven days, 70% chance in the next 48 hours as of the 2 p.m. advisory. And then if you glance out over the Gulf of Mexico, there's our bad boy we've been emphasizing and hammering home on Weather Center for a number of days now. And I'll admit, again, it feels very good to finally see National Hurricane Center on board with something. Now, in my opinion, I don't think we're going to get anything major tropical out of it. And I think National Hurricane Center is picking up what we've all been putting down as well. They're saying that there could be some very gradual development before merging with that frontal line and running right into that subtropical jet that's going to help to really elongate it and prevent a solid center of circulation from consolidating. Looking at the infrared, you can see it's trying to get its act going. There's a little bit of an indication that there's something trying to spin a little bit of cyclonic curvature in the cloud features here. But if you look to the north, like I'd mentioned, that subtropical jet is flowing hard. That's going to increase all of our wind shear across the central and northern portions of the Gulf of Mexico. As it trans transitions to the east-northeast, it's going to get picked up and slingshot up in somewhere near the Florida Panhandle, maybe the Panama City area close to Tyndall Air Force Base up there, the Alabama coastline. Everyone, regardless, because of how stretched out like an accordion this feature is going to become once it runs into that subtropical jet, everyone's going to get some rainfall with this. Everyone's going to see tropical storm-like conditions with it because of the wind field and the interaction between our frontal boundary, the jet aloft, and just the tropical convection associated with this bad boy. I've also been looking at a few charts and there could be a chance for some pretty good surge along the coastline. And when I say surge, I don't necessarily mean inundation inland. I'm just saying we could see some good wave heights off of this. I know the European model overnight was indicating waves of maybe between 15 to 18 feet just offshore with an abundance of rain inland, upwards of four to five inches in areas near the panhandle of Florida, parts of Alabama, and Mississippi. I'll kind of draw a rough sketch right in through here. That's where most of our maximum precipitation is expected to fall. Anywhere between four to five inches with about maybe two to three inches to outer lying areas, especially as the system tracks off to the east-northeast, picked up by our jet in the upper levels. So going back to what I'd mentioned about the Caribbean later into the month of October, we're already seeing something at the tail end of a front form up, albeit we have a tremendous amount of shear to its north, so it's not going to be able to execute any really long-term development, which is kind of our saving grace here, because last night the European model, not only were the tropical depression, but the tropical storm probabilities were through the roof in comparison to how they've been the last few days, they had about an 80% chance of depression formation and between 40 to 50% chance of a tropical storm forming out of this. Alrighty, folks, so we're going to wrap up here. This is going to be the last pair of slides I show you. We're looking at 12Z Euro for the day today. We're still not seeing anything on the European model for development in the Caribbean, and I do believe because of the resolution of the Euro, it's not going to show it until we get a little bit further in time, or it may not show it at all. You know, that's to be determined, but I've noticed just through its track record, we typically don't see anything highlighted on our Euro definitively unless it's about to start to show itself between 120 to about 180 hours 
hours into the loop. It doesn't tend to favor trying to spin something up like the GFS at the very back end of the run because, you know, it knows for all intents and purposes. I know that sounds weird talking computer models, but it has an idea, a semblance of we're way too far out. It's going to be a lot more inaccurate if I decide to spin something up at 240 hours out. The reason I bring this up, though, is I want you guys to turn your attention out to the MDR. As we mentioned on the visible satellite at the very beginning of this video, if you go through time, you can see Tropical Storm Sean working its way up towards the central Atlantic, but the Euro, as of 0 and 12Z today, wanted to suddenly take a westward path, albeit still weakening because it's going to be hitting all that shear, but what I really want you guys to notice is look off to his southeast. There's a little bit of increasing in the winds associated with that other tropical wave, that disturbance or that area of organized convection coming off of Africa right now. And as you get towards the very tail end of the run and it approaches the Lesser Antilles, you start to see the winds on its northern side begin to deepen and intensify a little bit more. So very interesting, very curious to see what the ensembles do with this because it looks like the Euro deterministic model does want to take an aggressive tropical wave or maybe even a disturbance in towards the leeward and windward islands as we get closer to that same time we could maybe see something forming in the western Caribbean. So for all we know we could have two maybe three systems out there all at once for the back end of October just as we are preparing to really hit the downward descent of hurricane season. So again guys it goes without saying hurricane season's not done yet. I know everyone's been saying the same thing and I'm in full agreement with that. We have a lot of hellacious weather taking place over the United States. There's a lot of frontal activity a lot of strong winds for almost everybody across the country to its entirety but I want to stay a little bit more focused on the tropics because this is a little bizarre right now. This is definitely not what a lot of us were anticipating. We figured by now El Nino was going to be in full effect and it's definitely represented in the weather conditions we're seeing across the country but it doesn't seem like the hurricane season wants to turn off just yet. So you best believe Weather Center Nazario and a number of the other sources you guys follow on YouTube and other social media are keeping a close eye on things out here and I can't wait to see what unfolds especially as we get closer and closer to Halloween. Last couple of weeks we were hinting that Friday the 13th could be the fateful weekend we see something else for in the tropics. I'm starting to slowly but surely change my bet, pull it off the table, and put it closer to good old Halloween, October 31st. Especially if we do see something trying to deepen, whether it be in the Atlantic, a la what the Euro is calling for, or even in the Caribbean, depending on where that shear and how much that trough decides to dig its way down. Once again, guys, the key takeaway for everything is I'm watching the large-scale dynamics. I'm not honing in on single models or single features. I'm looking at the big picture. And the reason I want to look at the big picture more so is because the models were all in agreement. Strong trough, strong ridge, very meridional north to south pattern. Nothing's going to move. We're going to wash the tropical AOR of a lot of moisture out there in the Caribbean. Nothing's going to form. And because of that distinct shift in our pattern, the weaker systems in the upper levels, a lot of our models are indicating, hey, you know what? That makes it a lot more favorable. That leftover juice, as Mike's weather page would say, could spin something up. Anyways, guys, we're going to wrap the video. Thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you had a great weekend. I hope for those of you here in Florida and pretty much across the eastern United States, for that matter, could enjoy the cooler fall weather that has entrenched itself across the eastern CONUS. So for that matter, we'll see you tonight at 8 p.m. If you have any additional questions or want to take a look at some of the incidental material that I may have brushed over in this video, please feel free to hit me up in our 8 p.m. Tropics Talk or drop a line in the comments below. More than happy to help you out with anything or answer any questions, comments, or concerns you guys have. Thank you very much for joining me this wonderful Monday afternoon, the second Monday of the month. We'll see you later this evening for our 8 p.m. Tropics Talk, but until then, guys, you know the saying, this is Weather Center Nazario, signing out.